So, um, is the microphone good? Can everybody hear me? Perfect. So, hello everybody and welcome to my talk on conversational computing or how Okasaki made McCarthy ride once again. Now let's start off with some uh, puzzle time since everybody's probably a little bit sleepy by now. Uh, does anybody know this guy? <laughs> yes, who is it? <laughs> John McCarthy, of course. Especially the closure conference, everybody knows him. John McCarthy is the guy who coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. He discovered the theoretical foundation for the half a century of computing so far, LISP. And on top of that, he also invented garbage collection, time sharing, and non-monotonic reasoning to boot. Now, does anybody know what John McCarthy published in the year 1959? No, it's not the list paper. Thank you for that incorrect answer. The correct answer is that John McCarthy published this paper, Programs with Common Sense. And this is a paper in which he introduces a concept called the advice taker. Now, the advice taker is basically some sort of thought experiment for a system that lets you speak formal statements to it and that then will automatically be able to improve itself and its understanding of the world using those statements. And uh, in the paper you see that he didn't really mean that theoretically either. It really assumes that this system has common sense in the form of a rich repository of knowledge and that you, it would be able to take any inputs and make the right decisions given all the other information it knows about the world. Sort of just like a person would. And uh, he sets several, well, maybe somewhat ambitious goals for this, like all behaviors must be representable in the system, changes in behavior must be expressible concisely, all aspects of behavior must be improvable, the machine must have concepts of partial success, and be able to create subroutines. Now, if you read this paper, uh, you would sort of get to what I call uh, McCarthy's conundrum. Because, to be honest, it's a pretty odd paper. It's pretty vague, uh, it's somewhat incoherent at times, inter internally contradictory in places, and in some way also just sort of very obvious. Like, yes, of course we would like a computer that can do everything, duh. But, as we all know, that's not everything that McCarthy wrote. Because McCarthy also wrote papers like the Lisp paper, which are incredibly clear, beautifully concise, amazingly elegant, and groundbreaking like never before. Now what's going on there? Well, my theory is that this is sort of classic left-right brain intuition thing going on. What were sort of McCarthy's modus operandi for his big breakthroughs was to sort of first set his filters wide open and you sort of let in many false positives, but make sure that whatever was the right ID was, that it's in there too. Sort of just collect all the data, everything that could possibly be true. And then uh, just churn and churn and churn and work on it until you get to a sort of a flash of insight. And once you do that, evaluate everything in the context of, context of that insight, eliminate all the distractions, and simplify your ID to its core. Now, my theory, the key theory of this talk, is that that's how McCarthy came up with LISP. So he took programs with common sense, worked on it for 18 months together with Marvin Minsky to sort of get the flash of insight to use Alonzo Church's Lambda cal Calculus and reduce the woolly thing of the programs with common sense into the original answer, the LISP paper that was published in 1960. And I like this thing because the LISP paper actually says part one. But there isn't a part two yet, which is pretty meaningful in the context of this talk. Now, so in my theory is that this is how Lisp was created. But after that, well, we haven't really heard much. But 40 years did go by. And in those 40 years, McCarthy, uh, two things happened. The first was that McCarthy went to a conference and he attended a talk called Computer Languages for the Year 2000. Now, McCarthy really didn't like what he heard there because he thought the talk wasn't nearly ambitious enough. And uh, luckily for us, another thing that happened is that he started reading some books by this guy, John Searle. Now, John Searle is a very interesting philosopher for programmers because he basically describes how humans use language to build up the part of the world that's only in our heads. 
how we use words to create customs, laws, and institutions, and how we generally make the social world. Now, I really like to imagine that John McCarthy was sort of reading this book, and just like happened to me when reading it, had his eyes drawn to these parts, where Searle uses parentheses, nested and nested concepts which reference each other to describe how we create our social world. And well, after having been challenged for what the right programming language for the future would be, he decides to sort of get himself worked up one last time and deliver this paper. Elephant 2000, a programming language based on speech acts. I meant what I said and I said what I meant and elephants faithful 100%. Moreover, an elephant never forgets. Now, what is this thing? It should be fascinating, right, to figure out what McCarthy's uh, vision for the future of programming would be. Well, if we go through it, uh, here he sort of says that uh, inputs and outputs in this language are analogous, like are sentences analogous to the concept of speech acts as used by philosophers like John Searle. Um, it's also a language whose correctness is described by correctly performing those speech acts, sure. And it should be able to generate sentences expressing forms of correctness about itself. Oh, okay. Um, it's a language that might do without data structures because it has a full history of the past that can be referred to. Well, that's okay. Um, oh, that's back. Um, furthermore, programs in this language are also themselves also sentences of logic, which don't need to model commands in terms of changing program state. So, okay. And uh, these programs can provide output statements not just about their formalized result, but also the practical effects on, their, on the world, which is sort of saying that they cannot just tell your kids to clean the room, but actually make them clean the room, which is, I don't know, pretty ambitious. Um, he says that the most obvious application for Elephant are applications that do more than just CRUD. Okay, sure. And finally, in conclusion, while Elephant gets close to hard AI work, it doesn't really need to be. Now, if you read this, uh, like actually a lot of people who read this sort of assumed by now McCarthy has lost his, had lost his edge because, well, he was getting old and uh, the paper was once again this sort of fluffy thing. It's hard to make sense of this. Like, yeah, like, like, like you know, uh, even I had trouble reading it at first. But what if instead of dismissing it, we give him the benefit of the doubt and assume this paper might be another advice taker? What would the flash of insight be this time that could take Elephant 2000 and give us possibly? Recursive Functions Part 2. Well, luckily for me, I read the Searle book before I read the Elephant 2000 paper, and I found a little hint there. And here is a page from Searle's book where Searle is basically arguing that the key aspect that differentiates our linguistic society from pre-linguistic societies is our ability to express novel statements out loud in a social context because of the simple fact that we can't unspeak what, we spo what we've spoken, and by saying something out loud, we sort of create a commitment to having made it sincerely. And like this is a, a thing for my Kindle, and there's a little note there, and it said, there's a very interesting parallel here with immutability. Because basically it's saying that immutability is the key to making our social world tick. Now, it took me a while to understand that, like, how does that relate to, you know, Lisp or to what we are working on, though. And at some point I realized that as Clodurians, we are very intimately familiar with a certain kind of immutable speech act. X but with Y. This is an immutable speech act that we work with every day. Although we probably don't recognize it as this. We do recognize it when we put it like, this, though, this is an immutable speech act. And I think that that actually is the key that gives, that would get us from Elephant 2000 to the list paper part two. Purely functional data structures, persistent data structures, immutable data structures, whatever you want to call them. So if we actually go back, can I skip a page? Yes. 
So if we actually go back over the Elephant 2000 paper, here we see uh, that he's, well, when he says that inputs and outputs are uh, well, meaningful speech acts, he's basically sort of describing Ola Kishilov's work on extensible effects, which is state-of-the-art research in making side effects first-class citizens in functional programming languages. So in that context, this actually suddenly makes quite a bit of sense. And, well, using a history of events uh, instead of a data structure, basically describes event sourcing or the Lambda architecture or the unified log, which all by themselves are state-of-the-art technologies at this very moment. And, uh, well, this one about the doing more than CRUD is pretty vague by itself. If you look at the examples in the paper, this sounds, looks remarkably a lot like what Datomic already offers us. So I'd say we're probably onto something. But, well, as I said, like these things, well, we can already do all that. So that leads us to the questions, well, so what? We can do all this. Well, there's one more thing that McCarthy also mentioned in his paper, and that's this. Elephant programs themselves can be represented as sentences of logic. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, I think I can best demonstrate that with a bit of code. And that's uh, this piece of code. So this is just very simple closure code. Like we have some uh, commission calculation function, and uh, we calculate the commission over 10 euros. Sure. And uh, then at some point, okay, the commission changes. It gets a base fee. So uh, we add that. We change the commission function. We calculate the commission again. Now it's 250. So very fine. But what happens if we now want to calculate the old value again? Well, the thing is, we can't, because the old commission function is gone. It's mutated. Closure is actually half mutable. Uh, to be fair, pretty much every other language right now also is half mutable. But still, it's a very key thing. And that, actually, I think is the key realization that McCarthy wanted to um, convey with Elephant 2000. So the thing that I think is what, what really makes McCarthy's puzzle tick is whole system immutability, or if you prefer a fancier term, fully pure lambda calculus. If we change this little part, if we let our system be systems become completely immutable, then we enter into a wholly different world. Then we move from uh, using the power of purely functional data structures in so all sorts of disjointed applications towards a unified formalism which incorporates this all into a cohesive whole worthy of being called recursive functions part two. Now, because McCarthy didn't get to name this, I thought I'd give it a go here. And I think we should call it conversational computing because it's well, inspired by speech acts. And uh, my definition of it is computing using sequences of immutable statements which reference the past. Now, <clears throat> McCarthy's prediction was that this would be the language for the year 2015. So let's see, let's see how his prediction fared. Well, actually, it turned out to be pretty right, because in uh, September 19th, 2013, Paul Cisano, the author of Functional Programming in Scala, launched Unison. Now, what is Unison? Well, Unison is a typed, fully pure lambda calculus in exactly the way we've just been describing. Uh, it does some more really cool stuff. So it's, uh, its AST is actually a content addressable Merkle tree, which means that every individual subnode in the AST has a hash and can be retrieved and identified by that hash. On top of that, he builds a really cool distributed computation model uh, by which you can take arguments and instead of uh, downloading the function that's behind a hash, just sending those arguments to that function on another server and basically get back a memoized fun function application. And because this all wasn't ambitious enough yet, he also decided to create a semantic editor with Predit style type correctness, <coughs> meaning that it's impossible to create incorrectly typed code in Unison. Now that's really cool, but uh, that's not everything yet. There's more. Uh, half a year later, Reed McKenzie released Oxlang. Now Oxlang uh, is based on his work building the Oxcart compiler. Uh, which was a uh, statically optimizing closure compiler. 
And he sort of kept optimizing closure code until he came to the realization that a lot of optimizations were blocked by the fact that namespaces were immutable. And in that sense, Oxlang is his effort of taking closure well, beyond the limitations of mutable namespaces by building a fully pure Lambda calculus. Uh, interestingly enough, I recently found out that there's another conversational computing language already being built, and that's Eve. Eve by none other than Chris Granger and Jamie Brandon of Lighttable fame, their new big project. Uh, it's not technically yet a fully formal Lambda calculus, but it is built on a fully immutable log which stores both the code and the data. So in that sense, it's definitely very conversational. It's also the only one that's already sort of usable. It has a usable IDE, which is also remarkably conversational because you sort of type speech acts and then create new pieces of data just by writing them, which is a nice thing. So, actually it seems like McCarthy was right, both about the IDE and the prediction. But, okay, so given that we have these languages, what can we do now that we have them? Well, I've given this idea something like two years of hammock time by now. So let me give you a whirlwind tour of everything that I've already envisioned that these languages will make possible. Now, the first things revolve around historical code awareness, because in languages like this, you have access to all historical code. Now, the first thing that changes is related to sort of what the Oxcard compiler does, is that Compiling actually just becomes creating an append-only machine-optimized reflection of your code, which can be very optimized, because whenever you call a function, you know that it's never gonna change, so if you're using a specialized version, you can just specialize the function. And this way, you can create amazingly fast code. Another thing that you can use this old code for is, uh, for example, if uh, as part of event lock processing, like we see with uh, the Lambda architecture and <laughs> spill the water, uh, that like, we're starting to really store all the old events we have. But currently, whenever you want to reprocess that, you cannot just use all the old code. You have to create all sorts of complex intermediary stages to keep it still concise. But in a language like this, all the old code is just still available, so you can just use it to reprocess the old events. That's pretty cool. But you don't need to stop there. And uh, what you can also do is to take the old code and the old code that visualize the data. And using that, you can sort of create long-running interactions. That's actually how I originally came up with this ID, because I was once asked to create a forms application in which you could sort of change the forms and change the validation and change the visualizations of forms, but the system had to span, like it was for, for doctors who tracked kids from birth to 18 years. So it had to span all the 18 years and all the data all the way back needed to be visible. With current programming languages, that's not really feasible. But if you have a language like this, you can take the old forms and just visualize them, render them using the old code, which you still have. Now that's not all. There's uh, more that will change. Another thing that will change dramatically is experimentation. In a language like this, it becomes really easy to create an alternate version, for example, for an A-B test. You just create a new function, you put it next to the current one, and send a certain amount of traffic over to it. But you know, when you think of it, uh, deployments, what are they actually, other than sort of really big experiments that are intended to sort of get all the traffic? So deployments can become experiments like this too. And the coolest part is that you can actually uh, decide that you take a deployment, but not automatically deploy it, but only deploy it if it performs better on some business metric. So you can use, for example, multi-arm bandit and say uh, this deployment will be automatically deployed if it increases the click-throughs, but if for whatever reasons they drop, it will be taken back out of production. That's really cool. Um, another thing that these languages make possible is that you can actually drill down to the full playback of user experience. So whenever something happens, you can sort of go in see exactly what that user was doing and figure out why something's happening, which is very powerful. But, well, that's not all. You, go, what is, you cannot just see a single user going through your system. You actually have access to the information of all users going through your system. 
And you can do really cool stuff with that. Like, for example, uh, analyze all your users and uh, query for users that are exhibiting certain suboptimal patterns. Like, they're using the interface inefficiently, they're stuck, uh, they're not using it anymore, they're stuck on a plateau. And then design an experiment that targets those specific users and provides them an intervention. And uh, you can then deploy that intervention, test it, and integrate it if it works well. If you do this a lot, then you actually start getting to an entirely different kind of system. It's what I call conversational interfaces. So there's interfaces that react to you using them. And that can be, for example, in the form of uh, an explanation when you first reach some part of the system, like many onboarding systems already do. But you can take it a step further also and detect uh, satisfying. So when somebody takes five clicks to do something that can be done in one click, and detect that and immediately propose a better approach. If that's not good enough for you, you can take that even one step further and, and say whenever you detect that someone's using your interface in a suboptimal way, rewind the interface, make them do it the correct way, so that you can actually have an interface that forces you to use it in the most efficient way possible. And uh, so if you keep doing this more and more and more, you actually get at some point into what I really call the conversational interfaces where it sort of becomes like a conversation you're having with a system. Now that's also what I'm taking our current company in, in the direction of, although we really cheat and we don't do this with a fully conversational system, we just store state machines in Datomic and that sort of gets us 50% of the way with 1% of the effort. Now, taking this into account, I would like to uh, extend our previous definition of conversational computing to computing using sequences of immutable statements, which reference the past, and using these systems, historical statements, to adjust system behavior, or make systems which act like people. Now, this is sort of a quick overview of everything it makes possible uh, functionally, like what it can give the user. But what about the non-functionals? What, you know, how does it work under the hood and what does it get us there? Well, the first thing to start is, uh, let's, uh, let's start off with a classic AST. That's the one thing that's sort of a constant in pretty much every language ever. Although in conversational languages, it's not really an abstract syntax tree, it's more of an abstract syntax graph, because, for example, old versions of the app can still use the same part, uh, parts of your current code. And actually, other apps entirely could be using sub, like sub, what is it, parts of your code as a library. Now, we were also talking about speech acts. So it's important to realize that every single piece of code is actually also someone's speech act. So here you see that John is referencing code from Liz and Mike, and Alice sort of ties it all together in the final app. <coughs> so if you're coding in a conversational style, you do that by basically creating an abstract syntax graph with node-level code ownership and a distributed version control system built in, uh, which is awesome, although if you talk with someone from Smalltalk, apparently they had this in the 80s already, but I guess that goes for everything. Now, the next topic is how do we get this code to the end user? Well, what happens is we, well, we sort of squish all this code together, and then the end user will get a reference to the root node. But well, the root node uh, sort of is the entire app, so uh, he doesn't need to download it all at once. He can sort of download only the parts he currently needs to, for example, display the first screen. And he would do the same for the database, where like, if you access the database, he only gets the data he currently needs, but not the rest. Which brings us to sort of the second cool feature of conversational computing which is its caching structure, because cache in the conversational language is never invalidated, because well, it's immutable data, it never changes. The only thing you can do is forget it if you run out of hard disk space or whatever. But as long as code is not forgotten, it can always be remembered, because if you once had all the pieces of data necessary to view an item, you can always view it again, which is really good for offline apps and well, in many cases. But let's continue. So uh, now, then the user has the parts of the app it needs, and it uses the data to generate, say, a login screen. Now, uh, suppose the user enters the login details correctly, it then 
would go off and download the code for the rest of the UI. And afterwards, the user keeps clicking around a bit. It, it comes across a forum that gets some more data. And like this, it slowly gets the rest of the data. Um, and well, that's sort of how you interact with a system like this. And uh, well, uh, oh, sort of, well, for me, it was like, OK, so where is the conversational aspect in this? Well, it's actually, if you look there at the, the login submit UI click, you can sort of view that as a conversation between you and an actor. And I call them transparent actors, which are basically actors you interact with sequentially, but whose actions you can predict barring certain synchronization or branching points. And basically, I found that this, like transparent actors, is a much better way to think about uh, isomorphism because it's not just about code share, is it? It's not about code sharing, but it's about if the other party you're interacting with, the app, is transparent enough for you to be able to anticipate its actions which is actually also what allows people to speed up turn-taking in regular conversations. Now, so far, it's been a one-way street of receiving data, but in a conversational, you can all, you, what is it? In a conversational database, uh, sending data is really simple because you just send it across, and it's just a speech check, in, well, like a datomic datum, for example. And you send it across, it becomes part of the database, which already exists of, well, everybody else's piece of data. <laughs> and uh, I think that's really powerful because databases then basically become uh, repositories of speech acts from users and developers with built-in provenance tracking. Now, the provenance tracking part for me is very important or very big because I think it's the ultimate monopoly buster. Whenever someone asks me about how Europe should beat Silicon Valley, I always answer with this. Because uh, I think like Europe is just never going to be set up for big monopoly breakaway successes, but we are very good at breaking down monopolies. And I think if you have uh, create a law that sort of mandates that every single user can get back all the data he put in, you get to a sort of situation where if every Facebook user had one day decided I've had enough and pulls their data out, Facebook could be gone in a day. And I think that would really enable a lot of innovation. Now, another feature you have is uh, conversational authenticity. Because if we see here, basically, well, you have like three actors. Another thing you can do is you can give each actor their own private key and then let those actors sign all their data. If you do that, then you get to what I call, yeah, conversational authenticity, which is where each speech act has a verified identity. Now, if you add on top of that uh, revocation and verification infrastructure so that you can handle lost keys, but also have a specific key that's tied to your passport, for example, you suddenly have the perfect platform for digital self-governance because you can organize a referendum in a matter of minutes. Now, finally, the final feature is conversational privacy because uh, so far all this data still had to go across the internet otherwise known as NSA-friendly territory. Now, is there anything we can do about that? Well, yes, there is, because uh, we can take the data, and instead of just signing it, we can encrypt it with our key. And then we can take that encryption key and encrypt it against the public key of our recipient. And that way, only they can decrypt this data. And that's basically how, for example, the ODR, the off-the-record protocol, works. And uh, if you use that, you even get perfect forward secrecy. And using that, it gives you an NSA-proof computing paradigm in which our everyday concept of privacy is actually embedded into cryptographic reality. Uh, with one minute to spare, I would like to round up my talk with this. Conversational computing, computing or how McCarthy discovered the foundations for the first and second half of computing's first century. So, if there are any questions, 